Food Price Challenge webinar, which is organized by the World Food Day National Committee of Trinidad and Tobago and is being hosted by the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries. I'm Verna Barrett, your moderator for today's session, and I'd like to welcome and introduce the very distinguished members of our panel. Senator the Honorable Clarence Rambarat, Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Good afternoon, Honorable Minister, and welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Good afternoon to my colleagues on the panel. Good afternoon, Trinidad and Tobago. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Sharon Hutchinson, lecturer in Food and Resource Economics and head of Department of Agricultural Economics and Extension, University of the West Indies. Dr. Hutchinson, we are very happy to have you on today. Welcome. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, Mr. Dipti, Ms. Barrett, and uh, thank you for inviting me to the World uh, Food Price Challenge webinar. Thank you. Also joining us is Mr. Rajiv Dipti, President of the Supermarkets Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Dipti, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Verna. Thank you to our hosts, and uh, let me extend a special welcome to my colleagues, uh, Senator the Honorable, uh, Ra Clarence Rambarat and Dr. Sharon Hutchinson, and hello to Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, and welcome to members of the public and the media joining us via Facebook and YouTube. We invite you to interact with us on these platforms by sending in your questions so that we can have them addressed by members of the panel closer to the end of the session. So feel free to submit your questions during the course of today's discussion. Now, the topic of food prices and our ability to put food on the table, it is one that is very close to our heartstrings. And in today's webinar, we hope to discuss several key factors that may have been impacting food prices locally. Among those topics would be the rise in feed prices, the foreign exchange issue, and in today's webinar, increasing we local discuss food production as an option, perhaps policy in agriculture and whether it is needed at this time, whether agriculture is a viable and lucrative sector, our farmers, how are they faring, and plans to control food prices in Trinidad and Tobago moving forward. So we would like to start today's discussion by getting a better understanding of our food prices and how they have been increasing, if they have been increasing, in fact, within recent times. Dr. Hutchinson, has there in fact been an increase in food prices in Trinidad and Tobago? And is there any sort of data that you can provide to help us to understand the extent of any such increase? Thank you, Verna. Uh, yes, there has been an increase um, in between January 2016 and January 2018. We saw a 10.4% increase in prices. Uh, but between that time, 2018 and 2020, it was relatively stable. So only a 1% change in that time. So things were looking good. And then between 2019, January uh and 2021 20, January this year, just a 3.1% increase, so a small increase. And one thing I want to emphasize is that the global uh, food price increase between 2019 and 2020 uh, 20 was about 3.4%. So we're coming in just below the, the global average, which is actually a good thing. So we're not seeing an explosion of food prices. Um, but the public will be aware that there's that about 3% increase for the last year. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Dipti, Dr. Hutchinson said it's pretty much a small increase, but my question to you, can the average person in Trinidad and Tobago be able to afford a typical basket of food to meet the nutritional needs of their family? And to what extent has the pandemic contributed to this? Okay, I think your mic is on mute, Mr. Dipti. Sorry, can you sure. hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I acknowledge Dr. Hutchinson's comments, and I, I would say those are the trends right now in the market. Now, with respect to the typical basket of goods, we're guided by the retail price index. When we look at the typical basket of goods, which might include items such as oil, flour, sugar, rice, uh, the what, what, what we call the uh, the consumer food basket. Uh, where prices have increased, the these are usually passed on to us by our suppliers, who are the either the local manufacturers working with imported inputs or importers of food altogether. We continue to see that we continue to acknowledge that we cannot put goods out that consumers cannot afford. Simply put, because these goods need to be moving all the time. 
So working with suppliers, we tend to try to keep those items uh, where possible, providing substitutes to meet the pocket of the customer. Certainly prices have increased. We, there's no denying that. But at the same time, I would, have, I would say that there's been no explosion of food prices, that these are continually incremental in the background all the time based on prevailing trends in the larger economic climate. Okay. Now, during the pandemic, Mr. Dipti, we heard of instances of price gouging and unscrupulous pricing in some instances. What sort of um, control does the supermarket association have when it comes to these sorts of challenges? That's interesting to note because whenever there are crises, and a major one was the flood flooding in 2018, and there were some instances alleged where food prices were considered. Now, in the pandemic, the major items that people were uh, panic buying would have been cleaning supplies, things like toilet paper, Lysol, uh, you know, disinfectant supplies, uh, bleach. Uh, these things, uh, it's unfortunate that it does happen. To say that it does not happen would be irresponsible. However, I would say that the members of the supermarket association in particular have reputations to protect as household names and household brands in their communities. So for them to engage in these actions would be in the long run detrimental to their own uh, brand loyalty where their communities are concerned. However, where these instances do occur, we do encourage customers to, re to record the incident because what, what, whenever we hear about price gouging, we always ask for records and persons cannot provide detailed in enough information either to the Fair Trade and Commission or to us because we can't just work on allegations. So in this regard, we are willing to treat with supermarkets who engage in that because we have strict vetting practices internally at the association to ensure that certain standards of adherence are met by our own member supermarkets. So. It is something that is frowned upon. It is something that happens. It is subject to demand and supply. Obviously, if something is shorting in the market, people are willing to pay more for it, and you will have um, some some stores taking advantage of that. But it's certainly something that is seriously frowned upon in the in the industry. Okay, thank okay. you, Mr. Dipti. Honorable Minister, we are very much in the midst of a global pandemic. How is the ministry ensuring that the average citizen can afford to put food on the table, especially in light of this challenging economic period? Thank you very much. Um, we've, come, we've come through a significant part of the COVID period. Last year, March, around this time, we were um, dealing with, with the preparation for the lockdown. Schools were closed and um, things were happening as, as we followed what was happening globally. But we managed to see the most important thing about the COVID lockdown and the last 12 months is the fact that we've not had a situation where you refer to when we when we got into to the end of March, we, had, we were hearing price gouging, scarcity, food shortages, um, price increases and so on. And I have been, I've been around the supermarkets, the, the municipal markets or farmers markets have not seen signs of that. Yes, we've had increases based on what is happening globally. But the most important thing is that the farmers demonstrated their ability to feed the country. And the, the most important policy decision we did we made as a government is to make agriculture an essential service, which meant that the farmers continued uninterrupted, their workers continued, the supermarkets continued. Uh, municipal markets, farmers markets and everything. So we had what I call a flow of food in, in the country in terms of the local supply. We, we rely on the imported um, sources for some of the starches and some of the um, things that people use in, in cooking, oil, sugar, um, rice, flour. And those were largely uninterrupted. Maybe there, there have been some um, uptick in the prices and I will talk a little more about what influences price increases, but we've had we've had supply availability. So in terms of availability in the last year, we've not had a an availability issue. We've not had major prices issue. Um, what we what we saw with the with the grain issue, particularly for the livestock farmers, is what lies ahead of us. 
and the challenges as countries erect their own barriers, they become more sovereign, they become more inward looking, they want to ramp up on storage, um, they want to compete for shipping and uh, loading at terminals and so on. We see that, that it affects not necessarily prices so much, but, but timing in terms of the shipment. And locally, once we have forex issues, it's going to it's going to be a challenge for our importers in terms of when their prices are cyclical, not not wildly cyclical, but it um you you have during the trading week you would have you know highs and lows, and when they when they have an opportunity to take advantage of a low price on the futures market, it has to be backed up by foreign exchange mm -hmm. because while they have um while they have in the past have traditional relationships where they extended credit in the current global market the goods are going for the people to the people who can make cash payments and forex availability is vital if we have to stabilize both prices and food supply so those are the issues i think we've done very well i contract i congratulate the farmers the supermarkets um the importers i can congratulate the people of trinidad and tobago Namdevco for the excellence with the farmers markets, but I think I think going forward, we really have to, to pay close attention to some of what is happening in the in the global market and determining how we could manage the flow of food and the prices at which at which they come into Trinidad. Okay, thank you, Honorable Minister. Dr. Hutchinson, we have seen an increase in feed prices following China's growing demand for corn and soybean from North American suppliers also, as well as the extreme dry weather conditions in South America affecting yields there. We also heard that due to the decline in the industry with the cattle farmers and they, they have started to use milk to make products like ghee and dahi, which is a product similar to yogurt. But now with the increase in feed prices, they say they may have no choice but to increase the prices of their products. To what extent would food prices be impacted as a result of this feed price issue? And should consumers be worried? Well, I think uh, one of the things I, I want to back up, what the, one of the things the Honorable Minister just said, that that international market is now really critical because it isn't as if there is a global shortage of grain. In fact, there's been increased in exports and production in many countries around the world, like Australia, etc. So it is a, about us being squeezed out of that supply chain, getting the food in, getting the inputs in. To Trinidad, right? Um, so when we talk about shortage, it isn't about a global shortage. And I just want to make that very clear. Now, the prices will be passed on to consumers in as much as the suppliers may not be able to absorb the price increase, right? Um, but on the other hand, consumers will have to make very many choices about substitute goods available to them. So if the price of ghee goes up, for example, consumers will now have to start thinking, is there any substitute for ghee in my basket? For some people, that might be yes. And some people will say, no, I have no substitute for ghee. So that is sort of where the personal decision comes in. So consumers can expect to see an increase in the downstream goods um, that would use the, um, the higher dairy products, for example, in this case. Um, but if there are no substitute goods, then the consumers will be forced to accept the higher price. And so then it becomes about competition in the local market, what other substitute goods could come in and fill that void. But it really goes back to us getting to a place where we could perhaps produce more of our own feeds locally. I think we've kind of lost the ability to do that heavy R&D that we used to be engaged in, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. Um, where we were getting into silage options, um, feed options, using byproducts, waste products. I think we need to get back to some of that. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Dipti, how concerned should we be about the impact of this on food prices in Trinidad and Tobago, seeing that both uh, NFM and Master Mix, they would have also increased their prices by uh, 14 and 10 percent respectively. What can we expect? You know, I want to... I want to agree with Dr. Hutchinson where she said that some 
that we're looking at substitute options in a lot of categories right now because in terms of the average consumer accessing certain price points those options need to be available on the supermarket shelves so whereas brand loyalty was a huge staple of the past today for, for today's consumer not so much they're more about accessing value for money now with regards to the increase in feeds to be honest, we're at these supermarkets, we're price takers, we're not price setters. Uh, that it's, it's a situation where if our suppliers are telling us that these prices are going up, then we'll have to put it out to the market at a certain price point. However, uh, consumers always have the options to trade down. There, there, are a lot, there are a lot of options on the market, especially when it comes to um, poultry. I, I know a lot of our stores deal in frozen meats and not necessarily fresh, so it's... Um, it's 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 a point to be well taken in terms of uh, uh, what's going to happen at the supermarkets, but certainly once an once a supplier indicates that prices are going up, it's going to have an effect, no doubt. So no sort of pricing control mechanism that you can think of to possibly help to curb the impact. Where when the cost of operations is affected to an extent that you cannot control or continue to absorb. The price increases because sometimes if if price increases were abnormal and and it's a one-off we'll try to work to absorb the price increase but it, but during the pandemic price increases have been abnormal for a number of reasons forex access um you know shipping that there, there, there's been so many challenges that have been novel in the last year and that would have contributed to any slippery price increases. We don't see this as being the new normal. Should there be some modality of going back to a new normal, to, to, to the normal that we knew before, then we expect prices to go back to typical cycles that we've seen in the past. Okay. Honorable Minister, in a recent newspaper article, the president of the Cattle Farmers Association, um, Mr. Chris Medford, he said that this increase in feed prices was a nail in the coffin for cattle farming in TNT, and that comprises both dairy and beef cattle. And lactating cows need high quality grass and feed concentrates. And he went on to ask a question. Why should we be in this position where we depend on imported grains to make livestock feed when we can develop feed and grass banks in Madras, for instance? What are your comments? Well, the, the most important thing to me is the we, because whenever whenever people talk about about we, the we doesn't include them. They talk about the taxpayers of this country. So whether it's the rice farmers, the dairy farmers, you listen to, there is always a, a check to be written by the state. The fact is that dairy has been in this situation for decades. Um, when we did not have a free market system, and we had the negative list. We relied on Nestle to produce, to, to purchase the, the local milk and to supply it to the market. And, and the consumers bought, in, in particularly in the rural communities, they bought their fresh milk. But the fact is that a lot changed. Um, one was labor available to the, to the dairy farmers to um, poor poor productivity. If, if you ask Nestle or you ask the people involved in the in the business of livestock, they would point to reports of absolutely poor farming practices. Um, farmers not being willing to, to, to plant feed, not being willing to um, provide their animals with the feed that will give them the maximum yield in terms of production. And the animals have uh, the, the standard of production and level of production on the farms has, has decreased over time and they depend heavily on the government to provide input. The taxpayers of the country provide to farmers one of the most important thing, which is cheap land for them to farm on. So it is not a matter of, of just when they talk about of, um, growing our own um, feed, they're talking about the state. So when they talk about a, a grass bank in, in Madras, they're talking about me as a minister, in, you know, putting in millions to pay people to plant grass to give to farmers free. You cannot, you cannot function in an economy on that basis. I saw Riyad Mohammed in that news day article make a very good point, which is even when energy revenues were high, 
we were not we were not engaged in that sort of behavior. Uh, what we have done in the ministry, the first thing I recognize in our livestock um, part of the ministry is that these farms that we had uh, with animals and so on, all we are doing really is to is to grow out, feed, spend taxpayers' money feeding animals and really bring in very little value. A good, a good comparison would be the decision of Hope Farm in Tobago last week to sell eggs at seven dollars a dozen. Now you have you have incentivized and you have caused people to get into that business. There is a selling price in Tobago of about twenty, twenty two dollars a, a dozen for every dozen sold on the market with a subsidized taxpayer dollar. You're really hurting the farmers. So what we've done is that we've taken the Aripo livestock farm, eleven hundred and forty six acres of land and we've put it into a private-public partnership with an established operator who will invest upwards of $30 million in that farm and bring it to the level of production that will also help the smaller farmers. So in towards the end of 2021, as we head into 2022, uh, Aripo Livestock Limited will mm. double the, the production of local milk for sale to Nestle. They've entered into an agreement to sell to Nestle. When you go on the supermarket shelf, I said in the parliament some time ago, I'm very proud to reach for that pack that is local fresh Nestle milk. There's a Trinidad and Tobago flag on it now. And there is a, a significant part of the population that wants local milk and is prepared to buy it off the supermarket shelves in that form. So part of the, the livestock industry has to be configured around some large farmers. And we've had two PPPs so far. We have one down in New Grant involving a farmer from a Madras settlement who has relocated his farm. This is the only organic beef food that we have in the country supplying, and he, he's going to operate on 100 acres. And we are about to put out about 300 acres in Monjalu for private public partnerships. So the industry has to be configured around some some PPPs with with uh, with large farms, and they will assist in pulling the smaller farmers along in terms of technology, in terms of feed, in terms of um, increasing productivity on the farms, and that is how we're going to have a local uh, a milk market in the country that is a combination of local production and imported milk. We are not going to be able to, to provide milk for the country um, using only local sources, but the government is prepared to support a part of the industry on the basis of product increase in productivity. We're not going to allow farmers and to live by subsidies. We're going to have to produce, to compete, and to meet the requirements of the market. Okay. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Mr. Dipti, one month ago, you were quoted as saying that food prices are expected to increase soon and you were citing distributors' challenges and in accessing foreign exchange. Do you foresee shortages of certain goods? And have we already begun to feel the effects of that? So to address that question, I would go back to some of the discussions we had at the start of the year with some of our suppliers, those being uh, local manufacturers and distributors, um, essentially importers of food. Um, so from our side, what, what's what been happening since COVID last year, there was a US dollar facility put in place by Exim Bank to ensure a certain amount of import cover for uh, certain staples of food. We had come up with a list that was submitted to the government for consideration and we saw that 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 really was our parachute during covid to ensure a constant food supply however this this at, at the start of this year the challenges have been more exigent due to the fact that some of our importers have food let's just say they have a portfolio of 30 brands they have been dropping some of those lines of products in some category or to prioritize foreign exchange, either because one the product is too expensive for the local market to continue to access, uh, or two, the production capacity abroad has is now down to 15, now down to 50 percent because of the COVID um, operating, you know, health protocols at, at at certain factories. So we've seen some products within categories disappear altogether. We've seen that some, some of our distributors 
are really struggling to continue to import um, their, their goods. And what's been happening during COVID is that some of these foreign principles that you import from the credit relationship that was normal is now strained because they're looking for US dollars up front because of the, the, the situation of demand and supply. Remember, there's so much demand and supply right now for the cost of goods and how these relationships have been stretched. So some of our typical uh, importers have, ha, are looking for new suppliers internationally altogether, or they're, or they're trying to, to rearrange credit terms and relationships to suit how the foreign exchange is coming to them. So certainly there, there, there continue to be challenges, but where there are challenges for us, there are also opportunities. Uh, we look to see how local agriculture or local, you know, production could supplement what goes missing here on the shelf. And I think there's an opportunity for in many sectors where we're seeing things start to disappear, that we could re-engineer the demand for the local sector. Maybe they, maybe they can't produce for in the quantum that the nation would require because that, that's always a challenge with local production. The quality, the quantity, the consistency and reliability of, of produce and, and local production. But certainly where foreign exchange continues to be such such a challenge to the point where some yeah. distributors are telling me they're going to go out of business altogether because without cash flow, they cannot continue to exist. And, and this also has a domino effect on, on retrenchment, on employment, because they have to, they, it, it's, it's a situation that we're adapting to as a nation, because we also understand that this can't continue. Trinidad and Tobago is an import dependent nation. Everything so in this nation. On, so based on that, Mr. Dipti, what is the outlook for 2021? Are you saying it looks quite grim? I would say that that there's a prioritization of how our and, and possibly uh, a realignment of how our local companies continue to do business because we we are the supermarkets will will get the prices from our suppliers they in turn will tell us well look we're, we're continuing to carry this line but we're dropping this and we're adding this because it's cheaper and easier and and it, it's more consumer centric in line with what their pockets are can reach out to because if we are buying it at a price we can't put it out at a price point that the consumer can't access so okay, i think we're, yes yeah. Yeah. On that note, uh, Mr. Dipti, I would like to ask Dr. Hutchinson just to build on that a little bit when it comes to local production. Dr. Hutchinson, should we simply just wait for things to improve with respect to our foreign exchange inflow, or do we try to focus all our energies more so than ever before into local food production? Well, I think we really have to solve this foreign exchange problem because it is affecting so many sectors. It's not just food, okay? Um, and it's putting in a real cost uh, behind what everybody sees into the sector that we don't need. Um, how are we going to solve that is not within my immediate remit, but it is really obviously becoming a big elephant in every room, okay? Uh, what I do want to add, though, is that in addition to focusing on increasing productivity, we also need to focus on adding value. So that value chain, we need to develop the entire value chain and the opportunity for local people to get in to fill in the gaps. So like now that every time you go to the supermarket, as you say, uh, as Mr. Dipti was saying, some things are missing off the shelf. All right. That, that's what is happening now. That is a gap that local entrepreneurs can actually fill as if a value added products, because right now a lot of consumers are looking for convenience foods, um, whether it is um, ready to cook meals, prepared meals, snacks. And so you're seeing a small but important uh, in growth in that sector. I've been noticing it as a, as a consumer myself, where you're seeing some local brands emerging in certain areas, and that is the kind of uh, trend we want to see going forward. So that uh, if people acquire taste for these local foods, then, you know, post pandemic, they will get a foothold into the market and be able to build their business from that. So this is actually a good time 
for local entrepreneurs to step up, step in, and fill that gap where we're seeing the gap on the shelves. I want to build on that point in this the, the other topic when we talk a little bit about local food production. But before I do so, Minister, the big question, is there any simple solution to this issue of foreign exchange shortage impacting our food prices in Trinidad and Tobago? And what is the strategy moving forward? Well, before we get there, um, I've taken long enough to, to say what I always say. And that is when people approach me on this food bill, food import bill, I always say to them, send me a photo of your refrigerator, not, not the outside, the inside, and your cupboards. The fact is that we are eating ourselves to death in this country. And long before my appointment, I, I always said, the, the justification for the existence of agriculture is the impact it's going to make, make on our health bill. So I remember right when I wrote in the Express, I wrote about 1999, I believe, was the last time the Ministry of National Security um, budget allocation was under $1 billion. It's now $11 or $10 billion. Similarly, our health care cost is not rising. You know, we're building hospitals to meet demand, except it's a demand that we don't want. And we really have to, and, and the control lies within the hands of the individual, like before we came on, Vuna, I saw you with your water bottle. Um, thanks for saving the environment without the plastic. I am not as good as you are. But the fact is that individual health, um, lifestyle decisions really influences the food import bill. And the farmers have made available to us green leafy vegetables, fruit. Um, I, I don't think the cost of the cost of fruit sometimes is is really upsetting simply because of how it comes to the market. So the fact is that it's not a matter of getting the imported food and paying for it and getting the forex. We have to make a decision on what we need to eat. We are eating ourselves to death. And there are things that you really, I, I know Rajiv is going to get upset with me, but mayonnaise, ketchup, um, mar marachismo, ch um, cherries, some aspects of dairy, they just you just don't need it. And our population has to face up for that, not because I want to save on Forex or not because I, I don't like what they eat. I've, I've, um, I've, I was in the public last, late last year for what I, what I said about how, what people should and shouldn't eat. The point is that we have to decide as individuals um, what is best for health and make our purchasing decisions on that basis. And what you would see happening is that you'd see the demand for certain things in the supermarket falling off. And you would see the, the, the need for Forex also falling off. And if you, it's an easy, easy answer to the Forex situation. You know, we depended on oil and gas revenues um, to, to provide the US and those revenues have fallen off significantly. The taxation from the from the oil and gas companies, the quarterly ta ta um, ta uh, payment we get has fallen off because of production levels and because of pricing, and also because of tax exemptions given years ago that um, continue to to mean that the oil oil and gas companies do not pay um, certain types of taxation revenues. They are allowed to write it off. So the point is that we will have this forex challenge going forward because we're not earning at the levels we used to earn. But with or without the Forex, my position would have been the same, that for, for healthy living and healthy lifestyles, we have to change what is on our plate. We have to go back to old school, green leafy vegetables, protein, um, small amounts of starch, rest, exercise, and agua. I listened to a hundred year old lady at um they were interviewing her at a gym in Diego Martin, I believe it was last year or the year before. And that was her recipe for, for longevity. It's not changed in the last hundred or two hundred years. And um we don't like as a country, we believe that somebody else should do it. I should make everybody healthy. I should wave a magic wand, I should feed everybody. But you know what? Our farmers have been doing good, they could do better. Um, they could do better with our support. We've been working with, with them, and but we need the support from the consumers. We've been getting that at the farmer's market, and we need to wean ourselves off the unhealthy products that we consume. It's as simple as that. Now, Minister, unhealthy is one thing, but 
the prices of some local products are increasing due to the increased feed prices, for instance. Example, those that use dairy components for ice cream, for instance. Well, I, I mean, as from the health have been talking, People have been talking about the livestock. And um, the fact is that one, because one supplier, so the, the, the poultry market is out of it. The poultry market is, um, is not affected by increased prices. The livestock market and the segment supported by NFM has experienced a 14% increase in the prices. The, the Nutrimix has not include in, increased their prices to the livestock sector. So Nutrimix prices remains below NFM's prices and the farmers have the option of, of purchasing from the Nutrimix brand. Now the price increase had to do with, with um, global prices wanting in December but also the, the um, difficulties in getting a boating spot for the delivery, the delivery vessel, and there were delays and so on in arriving in Trinidad. So what we what we're seeing now is the increases on account of deliveries that came in January and February. Um, those prices will will depend on global prices and and how you know um, the availability of forex. As I said, the, the, the these prices are cyclical. Grain prices are cyclical cyclical. We have gone through periods of, of um, very moderate prices um, for, for, for a long period and we face in the market. The, the question is, you know, when people, I, I guess, lurking in the minds of everybody is that government comes and absorbs the increases. Well, I don't think that is something that is that is going to happen. But green is just, the green, the 14% increase is just one item a particular segment of the livestock market that relies on, on, on grain and relies on the NFM brand. But across the board in terms of the vegetables, in fact, Pak Choi, for example, was wholesaling at a dollar for one um, last week Friday. And it has to do with, with supply onto the, onto the market. So now we're in the dry season when you have may have had uh, problems because of the excessive heat. We've had a lot of rain, not a lot, but a fair amount of rain every day, enough to, to keep the fields um, watered. And we've seen the production and we've seen the prices. Um, if the weather changes, we will see the impact. But we also have um, a fair amount of protected agriculture in the form of hydroponics and um, shade houses. And those are going to increase. We're currently working with, with um, a major international retailer who is, who is going to establish a hub in Trinidad and Tobago that will see a significant increase in how many uh, farmers are engaged in protected farming. And it is something that the government is going to support and it is going to stabilize um, pricing and the things that Rajiv and his sector look for. And it is also going to help us to shift in the context of climate change away from the risky farming that we do in flood prone areas and move into, into protected farming that would be more stable. And all that investment is coming from the private sector. I know people don't like to hear me say it, but um, the one thing that I've been consistent in my professional life so far is that I've always held the view that the state needs to have a very small footprint and the private sector needs to be facilitated in terms of of the economic activity. Now, agriculture is, is, of course, something that is very emotional. It is food, and it is one of the places where private and public continuously intersect. And it's a good place for us to, um, to collaborate and get the, get the investment in. We've had some significant investment, and we are, have been working with um, investors who would continue to invest because they see the opportunity in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Dr. Hutchinson, some have called for an overarching policy framework for inclusive and sustainable agriculture. Some are saying that agriculture is underinvested and, and failed policy it's suffering from. What are your comments? And do we really need some sort of strategic uh, approach to policy in agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago? Uh, yes, we do. I think uh, we've had we have a number of policies, um, but they're not coming under a big umbrella right now. So we've had agricultural plans over the year. We do have a vision 2030. So you have plans in different ministries that are going to support um, agriculture, but it's piecemeal. 
So what is needed now really, and we've been talking about it for a long time, is a national food and nutrition security policy that would essentially put everything under one umbrella for the long haul. I think one of the things, whether you have a pandemic or you don't have a pandemic, you need to have you need to have a long term vision about how health, wellness, availability, stability, and all of these core elements come together overall, and what kind of support structures are needed when things don't work well. So just as how you would have a national disaster plan um, for natural disasters, and so you'll need to have an economic plan for how you're going to support all these stakeholders along the value chain. So for example, um, reducing risk among all the actors, particular, particularly farmers, we still don't have a, a national insurance scheme, for example. Other countries like Jamaica have moved ahead to insure their farmers and fishers. Barbados has started that this year as well with Sajiko. So there's some low-hanging fruit, I believe, that could fit into this overall policy that we need to get back on the table. We've had a bit of starts and stops over the years, so it isn't as if we haven't try to uh, develop plans, but I think we do have to enact them and get everything working together so that when you have a situation like this, you already have building blocks in place to react to it efficiently and work through all these challenges. So that's what I'm seeing overall. Sure, thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Honorable Minister, I would really love for you to respond to that. The need for a national food and nutrition policy and a national insurance scheme. What are your thoughts? What are some of the development plans well, we that, have working on? I know that people love these plans and these long documents that another minister comes along and replaces it with something. I was very clear when I came in as minister, there were at least 15 plans available to me going back to 1956. And I found that the 2001 plan prepared by ICA, which set out maybe about 60 um, deliverables, was a plan that even 14 years after was a good plan. So at the same time, I did in fact commission a, a national food and nutrition plan. I got an 85 page document and um, and found great difficulty in navigating it and most likely implementing it. And the Roadmap Committee has given us exactly that, a roadmap for agriculture. They've identified 10, 10 areas that we should focus on. 10 areas are not new. They are things that have been said before, uh, value chain, food system, reliability, um, climate change, protecting. This has been, it's been around a, a, long, a long time. So. Um, it is it is a matter of implementation there is there there is sufficient available to us to tell us what we need to do but i would say that the roadmap committee report represents the way forward for us um, out of that will of course come things on the operational side how we how we get it done how we get things implemented and it would not be it would not uh, three things you hear from me all the time when i talk about agriculture one i talk about land tenure I've spared you that so far today. I talk about, about individual responsibility in terms of our ability to control what, what happens in the marketplace. And um, the third thing I, I talk about is this issue of the public service. This public service is not capable of taking this ministry and this country forward. Um, there, there are tremendous challenges in trying to keep up with the private sector, trying to manage, trying to service the private sector with our out, outmoded model of operation. I find it very difficult to navigate in an environment where we do not we do not have, you cannot manage staff, you cannot manage deliverables, you have accountability, you are responsible to the to the country and to the parliament, but you have no um, control over performance and promotion and transfer and discipline and so on. So what what is the thing that we overlook because we tend to protect the public public servants and the public sector. We tend to protect them, but I have been very open and consistent in saying that as we modify how we operate and as we work closer with the private sector, we need a modern public service that, that is supportive of some of the flexibility that is required, some of the timelines that must be met, and some of the controls over cost that must be instituted. 
Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Dr. Hutchinson, we've been talking about policy in agriculture, local food production, but a main element of all of this is our farmers. How are our farmers faring and is agriculture a lucrative and viable sector at this time? Because we've been always talking about making agriculture look sexy again. That is Mr. Avina, Minister Avina Singh's usual quote, making agriculture sexy again. Is agriculture really lucrative? It's a, is it a viable sector and how are our farmers faring? Well, it's a mixed bag. I mean, some commodities are definitely more lucrative than others. Uh, and we've been showing strong production in some areas like hot peppers, pumpkins, some of our uh, vegetables have been doing very well and root crops as well um, has been doing pretty well in the last uh, few years. But what is happening is that we are not increasing our yields um, to match the competition. So what when you have uh, at an international level when people when countries are starting to talk about production they really start talking about if this year's yield is higher than last year's yield and so they're looking for consistent improvement in in output per hectare for example every year we are not at that point yet of of, of focusing on how much better we're doing over time per worker or per unit of land. I mean, you can't just talk about production, right? It has to be about productivity. So every time we stay put at the same level uh, or even go back a little bit, we are actually falling really far behind the leaders in a particular uh, commodity. So I, I would talk about rice, for example. Our, our productivity in rice is extremely low compared to other rice growing areas. And that is part of the reason why we have such a high difficulty in competing. So I understand that the Honorable Minister um, was indicating that we might be able to change the food import bill by changing some habits. But in fact, the production would not be able to keep up to fill that gap unless we increase productivity significantly. And that's going to re rely on innovation uh, from whether it's economic innovation or technological innovation, but we have to innovate um, our systems, the way we do things, the varieties, all of that has to come together for us to improve um, output, right? And reduce risk at the same time. So there are several things that need to go into becoming a better competitor on the global market. We can't displace imports just like that. That's the bottom line. Now, last week, Dr. Hutchinson, farmers in Penal, they suffered losses in flooding, right? Now, there are rice farmers who cannot even repay loans for agricultural equipment that they took. There are rice farmers saying that they are practically begging for monies that are owed to them from NFM. And as you rightly said, we are practically down to 12 rice farmers from 6,000 in 1995, according to a newspaper article. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Dipti, in instances like this, before I get to the minister, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Dipti, in instances like this, what role does the Supermarket Association play in offering any sort of assistance to farmers? Hi, hi, hi Bruno. I, I have to say that I agree with a lot of the comments made by the Honorable Minister, as well as Dr. Hutchinson. Um, the public service is definitely one area that needs to be modernized. I, I would also say that if you talk to any of our supermarkets, we have absolutely no problem purchasing supplies from local farmers. The question is, is the local industry able to supply the supermarkets, the quantity, the quality, the constant supply and volume that we will require as well as at a competitive price to the local stores. And, if, and, and for example, let's look at rice. If we, if we do a benchmark of our rice industry to what our regional suppliers are or international suppliers are, how do we position that local production? And by that, is the customer willing to consume what is locally available is the primary question. Remember, our jobs at the supermarkets are to provide the needs and wants of the consumers. And the short-term answer here is that it's very obvious that what is locally available will not meet the customer's needs. However, given the shortage of US dollars, it does give the local industry a golden opportunity to re-engineer its offering 
And in the medium to long term, the industry and the local supply chain can become an invaluable contributor to reducing this burden and the possible significant consumption of foreign exchange. So I hope that that helps. Sure. Now, Minister, I'd like you to, Honorable Minister, I'd like you to also respond to, to these suggestions that have been put forward by members of the public, agricultural economists and professors in the field. There have been suggestions such as setting targets to produce, for instance, 25% of the rice we consume. Uh, how much rice are we uh, producing right now uh, compared to the what we that, would have? Mm -hmm. The thing is that the economists are not willing to put their money. I mean, I have, I have asked why why are they not investing in, in this pie in the sky rice, rice industry? I, unlike them, I appeared before the Joint Select Committee that in 2019, I believe, considered national flour mills and the rice industry. I appeared before the committee. I, I was not speaking to reporters secretly. And I spent three hours in the Joint Select Committee and I placed, I placed um, the position on, on hand side. The fact is that when you talk about 19, when you talk about rice production, you're talking essentially about Karani 1975 Limited being a rice producer, Karani um, producing two crops of um, one type of rice in the year and another crop, another type of a different type in the year. So three, three crops and, um, and, and contributing. But of course, nobody ever asked Karani what was the cost per pound of producing that rice. Same, similarly, nobody's asking whole farm, what is the cost of production of a dozen of eggs? When you take public officers, when you take pub the public sector, and you put it in, the, in in agriculture, for example, Karani Green, which boasts about exporting peppers and so on. And the, the cost per pound of pepper in Karani Green was 10 times the cost per pound of a private farmer. So that the rice industry as it is now, I'm on record as saying, there, there is the, the, the local production, NFM was before that Joint Select Committee, I'm not making it up. And they said that the rice that the purchase from farmers using taxpayers' money is put into pet rice. So that in the, the, the what what our farmers consider the local rice sector means cheap land, five hundred dollars an acre. If you if you had an, a, a commercial activity, for example, Rajiv in the supermarket trade, if Rajiv had to lease a, an acre of land in central Trinidad for a supermarket, he would pay about two hundred thousand dollars a year in rent. And if a farmer wanted it to, to lease for agriculture, he would pay $500 a year. It's a big difference. It's a big, big, big subsidy. And apart from that, we pay, they pay $100 for the water. There is no, no entity in this country, no, no business person in this country paying $100 for water during the height of the dry season. That's how much the abstraction permit costs. They get support, of course, like every other farmer, subsidies, incentives. The, the paddy is, is um, sold to the state at a guaranteed price. So they, unlike any other farmer in the country, they have a guaranteed price. The milling cost of $4.8 million a year is paid for by the taxpayer. And at the end of all of that cycle, the rice goes into pet feed. But the price per pound, the price per pound of unmilled rice in Trinidad and Tobago is higher than the price per pound of first grade long grain rice landed in national flour mills on rice and road. That is what, so if we say 25%, if you say 25% of the rice must be locally, it means that we're gonna have to, to clear down some buildings across the country and give it to the rice farmers. And somebody is going to have to pay that subsidized price. You're talking about somebody having to pay the, the difference because you're not going to pass on consumers who are accustomed paying a certain price to the imported um, processed rice at, at, um, from the importers. They're not going to take on a, a, a five-fold a five price hike in the price of rice. Somebody. And you know who is going to pay that difference? Not the economists. I hope they're taxpayers. Um, the public is going to have to, to take on that price. So the reason why we do not have high production as we used to is the absence of Karani 1975 Limited. And the reason people have gone out of rice is simply because of the economics. The cost of production is just 
higher than what the market is prepared to pay for the rice. But more importantly, the market is no longer interested in the white rice. I eat what, what, what we call lagoon rice. I would eat it, but the market does not want that. The market wants parboiled rice, long grain rice. That is what the market wants. And we have, the government has approved a parboiling plant for Kuva. Private capital is going to be invested in it. The, far, the private um, processor has already agreed to take the local paddy and also bring paddy from, from Guyana. And that is what we're going to have. We're going to have an industry that produces about 3,000 metric tons a year, supplying to that parboiling plant. Or if they wish to supply to island grain, they can do that. And the government is going to maintain the current level of subsidy. But the government is also um, quite quite satisfied that a portion of the rice that comes onto the plate is going to be imported rice. We're also um, giving another another shot at the hill rice in Maruga. Um, a second brand was recently launched, Red Gold. In fact, today I got a letter. So this is where I talk about land tenure. I went down to with my colleague, Minister Gopi Schoon. I've made several visits there, but we went down there and we launched the brand and we launched the rice. But the thing about it is that I know at least 20 of the farmers who are going to be producing that rice don't have tenure for their land. So they really can't can't make that investment in the land over the long term. They have to get that lease. They have to be able to, to get something that is bankable. They have to be able to access the loans and the subsidies and the support. And, and we prepared to do that. So this morning I got a, a letter from them um, on the issue of land tenure and I asked for all the information so, so that we could proceed with it. And with that comes the need to process the rice. And even though I've said that the state should not be in the business of the packing house and in running its own processing plant, you know, we've gone through those cycles. There was a time when the state was involved in, in making fabric and doing a lot of things in this country. but. If we've moved past that, but in relation to places like Maruga, I realize that if we really have to help them in terms of value added packaging, particularly for export, we have to make an investment. So one of the one of the units at um, the Maruga Agro Industrial Park would be taken by Namdevco and we'd outfit it with the equipment that will help some of the farmers in, in Maruga and that area. Do so. Do agro processing in relation to the other incomplete for, um, packing houses at Brecon Castle, Tabakit, and Tabakit. Uh, we do have private sector interests, and we're about to to conclude some of that. And the one at Piaco, which is operated by Namdevco, we do have private sector interests in in um, taking that over and modernizing it. And that is how we're going to do it. I'll tell you this. Um, we have on the issue of production, I've always said, and I'm going to what Dr. Hutchinson said, you have to be very careful with your production because people talk about ramping up production. Uh, you, you, you're going you're gonna to kill the people that you're trying to serve if you ramp up production. For example, if you were to, we, I know for a fact watermelon is retailing at $2 a pound right now, and it will come down to $0.99 cents a pound. When it is $0.99 cents a pound in, in um, central Trinidad, it is about 35 cents a pound on the farm. So that if we double production and we don't have a place for that increased production, the farmers are going to suffer in the long in the long term. So we have to we have to to increase the market before we increase the production. We have to increase the market, stabilize the supplies, get the right varieties and so on. We have Namdevco has just um you know, return to a consistent supply to Subway, for example. The quantities are still, we, we're doing about 15,000 a month um, in terms of pounds, which is about $150,000 in value a month. Now that 15 pounds of production that is going to Subway is not going to another place. It may not be going to one of Rajiv supermarket. It is not coming into the farmer's market. So. If we don't replace that, it means that we would have reduced availability on the market. We may have price hikes. So while we push, while we try to push what we produce into the restaurant trade or into the, the other the supermarket trade, if we displace in imports, great. But the other side of it is that those are that is production that may have gone to the regular market, the roadside vendors and so on. And we have to, in that way, we have to ramp up production to meet, to, to maintain a consistent supply. But we have to be looking at, at moderation in the prices. 
Honorable Minister, as we get ready to have questions from members of the public, um, some rice farmers are saying that the Maruga rice is approximately $50 a pound compared to the rice that they produce to just about $5 a pound. Can you comment on that? And also, the Venezuelan labor, many are saying that why, since you, you also highlighted there was a challenge with labor available to dairy farmers. While we're on the issue of labor, what are your plans with respect to Venezuelan labor, any at all? Well, I have... I, I talk so much that I'm on record on those those two issues for a long time. I'm, I'm on record as saying that that our farmers cannot cannot rely on local labor. I came very early in my term as minister. I said that, you know, I I dismiss outright this talk about CPF and URP. I heard that 20 years ago. It's a field. It's a field proposition. Farming is hard work. In some cases, it's very um, specialized work. And the farmers needed access to a reliable, trainable productive supply and they've gotten that with the Venezuela and of course it doesn't take long for some of them to get bad habits but by and large farmers have reported to me I'm on farms almost every day and I see Venezuelans at work I'm happy that we're going to extend the time and I hope that they stay here for, for long enough that we are able to to make use of their labor so the fact is that um, we do have all our local laborers who they, um, some of them have shifted they don't want to they don't want to be paid by the day they want to be paid by the task so they want a defined task and that is fair enough but i'm happy for the venezuelan labor that um allows the farmers to to continue uh, you have to remind me Vuna, of the first um, matter you raised yes so the first issue was when the farmers spoke about the maruga rice being 50 dollars right. a pound <laughs> I don't know which farmers talk about that. I've, I've, I'm also on record as saying because, you know, I, I heard some of the Maruga um, Hill Rice proponents talking about getting it in the hospital and the defense force. The thing is $20 a pound. It's a niche market. It's worth every cent of the $20. It's a niche market. It's a market that is um, people want it. People want what they call red rice. People want brown rice. They are, they are while they are held, held um, issues with consumption of rice, the fact is that culturally, um, people like me want rice on our plate and we want it every day, but we also welcome the opportunity for healthier forms of rice. So $20 a pound, it's not something that is going to be mainstream, but there is sufficient demand for it um, at $20 a pound or maybe even higher. And I know that the, the producers can't fill that market. There are certain things in the country, like I always say smoke fish, for example, is like it's like getting um getting the vaccine. It's 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 scarce. You can't you can't access it, but the demand is there for it. But it's just to get people um to to produce it. We have people on the East Coast doing a great job of it, but consistency, branding, packaging, meeting health standards, and doing it consistently. We have a um I listened to Dr. Hutchinson. We have a lot of good starts. So you see the product. In fact, I am always afraid sometimes to put up things on my Facebook page because my million followers, <laughs> um, they ask the obvious question, where can I get this? Where can I get that? The fact is that we can't say mainstream. It has to be in an up market or market, but we will get there. And the other thing I see that, um, in fact, when we launched a Red Cool, one of the major distributors in the country found his, his way down there two days after. The distributors Want, want the products. I know that Rajiv and the supermarket trade one local because there are people who want to support their communities. They want to um, support a, farm, a family or a farmer that they know and they want it. There, there's room for it and we have to, it's just a lot of handholding involved in, in getting products to market consistently. Thank you, Honorable Minister. So we are about to begin um, addressing questions that were put forward by members of the public and members of the media. So um, Richard Thompson asked the question, vegetable prices in the markets are declining, not increasing. People don't have the spending power. What can the Ministry of Agriculture do or suggest? People don't have the Yeah, the person is saying people don't have the spending power because vegetable prices in the markets are declining, not increasing. What can the Ministry of Agriculture do or suggest? That if the vegetable prices are declining in the market, then people, it's it's more affordable to people. I have seen the prices. The person is right. The prices are 
uh, cyclical, but um, they've been trending at this time. They've been trending lower, and the, the, the fresh fresh vegetables in the farmers' markets or the municipal markets is far more affordable than processed food and far more nutritious for the family. So, um, it because because people are having to having challenges in terms of their disposable income and in some cases in, in terms of income, then you go to not only what what is cheaper, but you also get the benefit of what is healthier. The most it, this is why the government went into the veggie boxes program through Namdevco and the Ministry of Social Development. Um, we saw that we saw that the most vulnerable in the society shouldn't be swiping a card at the supermarket and buying buying processed imported food. We should give them the opportunity to have um, a, you know, food at home that they could cook and they could eat healthy. And that is why the 90 pound box of fruit and vegetable along with the two, two um, local chickens made a big impact. And that is why we're going to resume it in April by continuing the distribution of those boxes to the most vulnerable in the society. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Also, a concerned citizen is asking, is food substitution a theoretical aspiration or do you think it can be a practical reality? And I'd like to uh, send that question off to Dr. Hutchinson to comment, please. I think we can uh, substitute, but only up to a point. Uh, there are some things we just cannot produce here because of our weather, etc. And then we have significant challenges with being competitive. So unless we become competitive in a particular product, we just cannot compete. So we have to focus on some items and do those well, and those we can substitute. But the idea of substituting everything on the plate, that is not possible uh, for us. We're too small, um, and this is always a challenge with a small economy like ours with limited land space. Um, but the investments that the Honourable Minister was talking about and the hand-holding, that is what I think we need to ramp up a bit more because that is the value chain development that he's like talking ours, about. With limited really land space. Getting the distributors um, in connection with the, the processors that the in connection Minister with the producers about and the hand in connection with the marketers that is what in I connection think a bit more because, because at the end that is the value consumers chain need to like ours, be clear on what that. are the benefits, what are the added value that they're getting for this product. Um, and there are oftentimes a disconnect. And then there's also a disconnect in terms of getting new people into that process. And when I say that process, I'm not just talking about into production because there's so many other things that people can do, whether it's marketing, advertising. So, for example, now uh, with this pandemic, uh, we're seeing around the world this global move towards uh, mobility of food. So not everything now is go to a place to buy. It's also about people bringing food to you. And that could be fish, that could be prepared meal, that could be vegetables. So we have to kind of think differently about how we get food and how we move food to the consumer as well. And then there's a space for entrepreneurs to fill in that, in that void that I think now is the time for people to step in. So substitution, but not just in terms of product, but in terms of services. Okay. as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. And Mr. Dipti, I'd like to direct this question from Mr. Kenny Plaza to you. When would the consumer be aware of what is safe to buy and eat, even though the GAP or the Good Agricultural Practices has been launched? Hi, Verna. So responding to that question from Mr. Kenny G. Plaza. Plaza. Um, I, I, w what, what we like to do is that sometimes at the association, we tend to reach out to NAMDEVCO to find out from their list of farmers, uh, and from their list of checks and balances, um, whom is GAP certified, what is the capabilities and competencies of, of, of some of these persons. Um, I myself was invited to visit an estate in Talparo the other day, and it was, um, it was quite the eye-opener in terms of hydroponics efficiency, in terms of the labor force. A lot of the things that the Honorable Minister just discussed, I was able to see in action for myself because labor is such a, a, an issue in this island. Um, so it, not all stores can make such arrangements to visit farms and 
and, and really, as I said, the, the key concerns for us is the quality of the produce, the reliability of the supply, the quantities that we ask for, and how consistent, uh, is this something that's sustainable for them to keep up? But really and truly, we've only seen very few be responsible with all of those critical cogs because, you know, for us, all those things are so important because if consumers see that they're not getting it consistently by us, then it becomes a problem. Also, the quality, these things are, we have to be so careful with them. So there's a lot that goes into planning that process. Now, Mr. Dipsy, while we are talking about that, I, I understand that you did some work in marketing as well in, in your academic studies. Now, there are some local producers, local manufacturers, and, you know, they probably are trying to get their products more visible in the supermarkets. Are there any sort of measures that the Supermarkets Association can put in place, for instance, to have these local manufacturers have their products, let's say, for instance, on the aisle ends where it can, you know, be a little bit more appealing as opposed to the foreign goods? Is there, is there anything that you, you all can do or have been doing, perhaps, That's in this area? That's a very interesting question, Verna. Um, and I just want to go back to the the, the thing about Nam Depco because we would have met with Honorable Minister last year, and um, he we would have indicated to him that we would like somebody from the SATT to sit on the board of Nam Depco, and 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 he he thought it was a swell idea. So, you know, from that point of view, we also want to you know push that as well. With regards to local products on the supermarket shelves. What we've seen during COVID, especially during the initial lockdown, is a lot of people would have had to stay at home and they would have been trying to earn an additional form of income or revenue by producing um, foods, you know, cakes, products, and then eventually they would try to get ideas to get into the supermarkets because they're seeing the supermarkets are still open, their essential services. So they're trying to figure out now, listen, how do I get my product up to readiness? Yes. Yeah, you know, so so this this became an interesting topic because there's no kind of handbook for consumers to really walk them through step by step to see. So we had a meeting actually with um yeah with we we had we met with Kariri, we met with Trinan Tobago Bureau of Standards, we even pulled together JMMB and Invest TT because this is something that we have coming together by the end of April. We're calling it the Retail Incubator Program, right? Um, so for us, we're taking some, we, we plan to inculcate a cohort of ready to go products and gestate them for the supermarkets. But we're also getting assistance from, let's just say, um, s some of the programs like um, export TT, they have they have some cohorts that are not yet ready for export readiness, but they feel that some of them are ready for the local market. So they bring them to us and we try to assist with this. Now, it, it, it's it's a very interesting thing, but we will be able to to really try to make a difference for persons who want to get their products in, into the shelves. So look out for that at the end of April. Thank you so much for that comment, Mr. Dipti. And one last question we would like to take from Ryan Davis. Um, Minister, Minister, Honorable Minister, we would like to uh, uh, direct this question to you. Mr. Ryan Davis is asking, what is the status of the fishing industry in Trinidad and Tobago? Has it been affected by COVID-19 and in what way? And what were the challenges before and what are the challenges now? So that, that's three questions there. So I'll, I'll just repeat. What is the status of the fishing industry in Trinidad and Tobago? Has it been affected by COVID-19? And what sort of challenges are there now? The, the challenge has been twofold. One is that for more than 100 years, we've functioned with the same piece of legislation for fisheries. It's about nine, nine clauses. And what has happened is that that has allowed the destruction of the fishing, the, the marine environment, and particularly, particularly fishing grounds, the inability to control the trawlers and so on. So that is one. The second one has been the infiltration of the industry by criminals. So not every fishing pirog you see out there is, a, is um, for fishing. And because of that influence around the country where we have fisheries facilities, we see the infiltration, the destruction, some of them we can't operate. For example, I was asked by a member of parliament for, um, there, there was a video I think circulating about the last uh, planche shares 
facility, which is opposite the police station. A substantial amount of taxpayers' money has gone into it. It cannot be completed every time we get to the electrical or some other um, thing that could be removed, stolen. We have people who remove it. And across the country, when you go to the fisheries facilities, you see you see that the people who use it themselves have no interest in, in maintaining them. And you see, in some cases, they have no interest in using them. For example, in Ottawa, Mayaro, you see um, fish being sold on the roadside. And we spent, in my first year, 2015, 2016, we spent about $2 million to get that facility back on track. So um, the, the big, the main thing with, with um, and of course, the, the weather conditions, we have more rough seas bulletins in, on an annual basis than historically we have. We see um, Northeast Coast, for example, the facilities have issues with accessibility because of the, the rough seas and the damage by um, the tidal patterns. So we have to continuously be investing uh, money in, in, in maintaining those and in keeping them whole. But um, it has to do with, with um, the amount of time, reduced time on the seas by the fisher folk, the challenge of the, of the breeding grounds, and the fishing grounds in terms of um, being able to, to continue the supply and the fish, the, the, the sector itself and the infiltration of persons who are non-fisher folk in the sector and, and using the facilities and the marine environment for criminal activity. But I'm happy to say we have a, a, a bill that has taken about 28 years to produce. It's in a joint select committee in the parliament and that should really set the framework for us being able to manage the maritime environment, manage fishing grounds, and um, you know have fisheries in the country run as a business. Of course, as we head into the Easter period, we would hear the the, the annual lament of higher fish, higher prices of fish, and so on. But um, prices have been have been moderate. I don't know if if the demand has been affected by by the COVID, but the fishing and fisher folk has not been have not been affected by the COVID. They've been able to apply their trade throughout because of the regulations exempt in agriculture and fisheries fall under agriculture. All right, well, thank you so much, Honorable Minister, and thank you to all the members of the panel for a very informative session. Thank you so much for your time. We have now come to the end of today's very comprehensive discussion on the food price challenge. And to all of those who would have joined in, members of the public, members of the media, we hope that you found this session useful. And thank you for all of your questions and comments. We hope that we were able to address most, if not all of them. However, we will make every effort to respond to those questions via our social media platforms. So thank you again. I'm Vuna Bharat. Thank you for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.